Well, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am Daisy Chapman Chamberlain. I am the Innovation Manager at East West Rail. For those of you who don't know, East West Rail is a railway project connecting communities between Oxford and Cambridge. If you'd like to chat to me about it, I'm more than happy to have a conversation after the session. But the session today is focused on digital signaling and the East Coast Digital Program. And we have three excellent speakers for you today. We're going to introduce themselves in turn and tell you a little bit more about their involvement in the program. So. We'll start with Ollie. Uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon. Is it morning or afternoon? Now? Morning. It's, afternoon. It's, it's just gone this okay. afternoon, it's hasn't it? 60 seconds <laughs> left right, of okay. the morning. So 60 seconds into good afternoon. Um, I'm Ollie Turner, and I'm the head of ERTMS at Go Via Thameslink Railway. So what that means in, in reality is I am responsible or accountable for all ETCS and traffic management deliverables in Britain's biggest train operating company. And um, so that means all ETCS rollouts. Uh, my my past is a, as a train driver. I moved into new train introduction and then into ETCS on Thameslink and ETCS on the East Coast Digital Programme. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Now we've confirmed we are in afternoon. Uh, my name is Catherine Aldale. I'm Head of Strategy, Policy and Communications at DB Cargo UK. So I work with government, do government lobbying, internal and external communications and marketing. So heavily invested in this project to make sure that all of our colleagues are fully aware, fully brought up to speed on what this means for us, but also plugged into government and network rail as well to make sure that we get the best outcome for freight as part of the programme. Afternoon, I'm James Webster. Until recently, I was the programme sponsor for the East Coast Digital Programme, working for Network Rail. Uh, and these days, I'm a director with Atkins, and I lead the organisation that is the strategic delivery partner to the programme. Amazing. So I'd love to get a bit of a deeper dive, and there will be time for audience questions at the end, by the way. Don't worry, I know it's a fascinating subject. I'd love to get a bit of a deeper dive into your roles and perspectives on the programme and involvement. So maybe we'll go the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah. So I started on the programme about five years ago and uh, that's when the programme was conceived. And if I rewind back to then, uh, we were basically contending with a choice. The choice was, do we as, a, as an industry invest uh, billions of pounds in renewing the signalling on the East Coast Main Line and locking in uh, today's signalling technology for the next 30 or 40 years? or do we make a step towards digital signaling? And that choice was really brought around by having about 80% of the passenger fleet already fitted with the necessary technology on board to have digital signaling, but not in use. And so there's this moment where you've got to decide, what are we going to do? It's a fork in the road. And as we considered that, we thought, well, why should we migrate towards this digital signaling? What's the benefit in it? Now, just to explain quickly what that difference is, today's signaling basically works on the premise that the driver has to look out of the cab window and read a signal, which we try and locate some, somewhere where they can see it. Uh, visibility can be an issue on our twisty network with tunnels and so on. And hope it's not foggy. Hope it's not foggy, hope, you know, in, in darkness and so on. Um, and from that, they know, may I proceed into the next section? That's it. That's all it tells them. And what we have is a choice with digital signaling is the information is going to be relayed now, instead of via a signal out on the track, directly into the cab in front of them. It's going to be a continuous feed, and the information actually tells them not can I proceed into the next section, but what speed could I be doing right now? And it gives them a constant speed profile that they're able to drive to. That speed profile is actually specific for their train. This is a big difference with conventional signaling, which is designed for the longest, heaviest train. Everyone gets the same information. With digital signaling, the train gets the information that's tailored for its performance characteristics. So all of the investment that we make in brand new rolling stock, uh, where, where trains can actually perform very differently from one another, if you imagine some of the modern high-speed trains perform very differently from a long, heavy freight train, actually being able to give them an information feed that gets the best out of that train enables us to deliver a very big step change in the capability of the railway without even changing the layout. So today's railway configuration, but suddenly we can do more with it. Suddenly we can have trains getting closer together, we can have trains moving 
um, uh, more readily when they're given an instruction. It comes straight to the cab. They don't have to wait to see the next signal. This system is far more reliable than today's system. There's very little on the track side um, to maintain and to go wrong. And we, we can expect a step change, therefore, also in our punctuality of service, less disruption from the infrastructure failing. Also really important for us in today is decarbonisation. By virtue of what I've just said, we do away with a lot of concrete and steel work from having those line side signals positioned with a big cantilever structure to be just right over a track or within sight. We do away with all of that. And we actually save about 40% of the embodied carbon versus today's system. So that's quite a dr dramatic reduction that we're able to deliver for the next generations of our railway. Now, I've described the system in terms of what we can get out of it, a safer, higher performing, greener uh, railway. The other big thing is cost. Not only is this going to be a high performing railway, but we're going to spend less to deliver it the infrastructure cost of renewal in the future is also far less because we're not doing all of these heavy civils works to replace the system out on the track side. And that is so, so important, not just in today's climate fiscally, but also for the network as we look to migrate towards a more sustainable way of maintaining our train control systems. Now, why? it sounds like an obvious choice, doesn't it? It sounds like, well, why, why wouldn't you just go for this new system then? Um, well, one thing is the upfront investment that is needed. Now, I've said that a great deal of passenger trains are already ready, but there's also many other users of our railway. And how we get other sectors there, how we get everything up to the same standard ready to migrate into ETCS operations, digital signaling, that all has, carries a lot of cost, and it's an upfront cost. So it might be cheaper overall, but we need cash and we need to be able to deliver the, a lot of work over the next few years to get to that point. The other thing, which is really important, possibly the most important, as we look at attempts to do this previously that have had to be uh, terminated or haven't been successful, is actually how do we deliver such a systemic change to our railway, the way that we operate the railway, not just the way that a driver receives information, but the way train dispatchers work, the way that maintenance works. We've now got a system that is no longer just on the track side, but it's actually on the track and the train with a conduit via a radio network. How do we maintain that system? How do we make it perform in an industry that is set up in such a fragmented manner? In an industry where there's such baggage of working together, operators, network rail, suppliers, how do we get to that point where collectively we can introduce a, a system change to our railway such that our people know how to work together, we have all of the systems needed to support them doing that. How do we migrate there? And that is the thing that we've invested a lot of time and effort as an industry, not as network rail, not, not as one supplier or anything like that, but collectively, how are we going to do this? And that has given rise to our partnership model, which is where we have genuinely set up this program as a change program, a people-centered change enabled by technology, but we've set it up so that we can develop it, we can literally design the program, and we can deliver it together in partnership. It's sort of like a super alliance made up of the freight sector, the on-track machine sector, the passenger sector, the charter sector, all different parts of network rail and key suppliers. And if you can imagine that with almost 30 different organizations brought together to deliver this, you're getting close to what we've got. So if I just maybe hand over to Ollie to pick up them. Ollie, why don't you introduce your experience on the yeah. program so far? And yeah, cheers, James. So, so as James probably summarized there, the sales pitch for ETCS is pretty great. It's pretty easy. I think you've probably sold that to everyone here already. And obviously, the reality of doing that's a lot more difficult. Um, and, it, and it's made more difficult, I think, in the UK because of the fragmented nature of our industry. For, the, for those of operators in the room, if you, usually you would get a network change turn up one day at the operator's inbox that says, we're going to do this to the railway, and you go as an operator, 
we, uh, thanks for that network row, but actually that's not quite right. We'd like to move that signal there. That, that, you know, you've ruined that PSR and no way can you take that crossover out. That's quite a traditional way of doing projects between network round and train operating company. So I think for us, it, it's that realization that it is an industry approach. And the fact is that that train is taking that signaling system on board and that you can only do it together, not separately. Yep. And I think for us, that's given, that's given rise to a much greater ability for an operator to actually have a say how it's going to be run. So if I, if I look at just the Northern City line, for example, our rimpet into that has actually completely changed how, how it was going to happen. The way we train our drivers has been moulded by us. The way we want to do our competency has been moulded by us. The way it actually looks and feels to a train driver has been influenced by us. And therefore has then been signed off and delivered as part of this industry model. So for us, so far, it's been good. There's been some challenges, you can imagine. 30 operators trying to agree on something isn't always, isn't always that easy. But actually, it's probably gone better than I imagined it would at the beginning. So it's because everyone's got that common goal to try and get there and get it running properly. It's almost like a peek into the future, hopefully, of GBR. You know, if we're looking for a more collaborative industry future, touch wood. Hopefully, this is what we're going to end up with across the piece. So thank you both. That's really interesting. I'd love to get the freight perspective, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been great listening to you, to hearing sort of the very, you know, top down. And sort of, I can give you a bit of an, exp bit of an overview of what it's like for a freight operator with this program, and we absolutely see that ETCS will be an absolute game changer for us in, in lots of different ways. I mean, first and foremost, we've talked about safety and what it means for drivers receiving real-time in-cab signaling. That, that is a game changer of safety for us and something that we absolutely welcome across the whole rail network. But also in terms of reliability, so in, just in real terms of replacing out-of-date old signaling methods and bringing brrand new ones into the cab. To, which will mean that we can offer a more reliable service for our customers. And that's what we're here for. We're private sector operators on the network, selling our commodity onwards to our customers in, in, in our supply chains. And talking about that, it's something that, um, that James mentioned earlier, is about capacity. That's where we, the freight industry, will see the real growth and the real benefit to us. So we'll be able to run more trains on the network. So using better, better utilisation of timetabling, better utilisation of, uh, better utilisation of capacity, means that we can run more commodity for our customers. And what that means in, in, in further terms is taking trucks off the road. So it's greater economic benefits for UK PLC because that's pounds back into, into Treasury's bottom line. But it's also carbon. It's huge environmental savings as well in terms of carbon reduction, taking trucks off the road and being able to run more freight trains. And it doesn't really stop there for us. That's, that's in more of a commercial benefit of just being able to grow. And obviously that's supporting government government target and ambition of achieving a 7.5% rail freight growth target. But in terms of us as an operator, it gives us a real tool to engage with our people. And I see it as kind of a, a challenge and an opportunity. So we're going to have a real challenge when it comes to training all of our people, which you touched upon earlier, Ollie. You know, so we'll have to make sure that all of our drivers and our engineers and everybody who's going to be working in, in new systems is fully up to speed of what they need to do. And that will be a headache and it will be a lengthy process that we go through. But on the flip side, it gives us some really great engagement material to go to our colleagues and say that we are at the forefront of absolute reform, of absolute brand new technology and optimisation of, of the rail network in the UK. And that's something that they can be proud of. It's something is to go out and put our virtual and our real arms around our colleagues, around our drivers, and get them on board with this. We have, we're, we're no different to any other operator, so we have a, a slightly older workforce when it comes to our drivers, some who are, who are maybe not quite as technologically advanced or really aren't quite as on board with this, but what it gives us internally is a tool to go out to them, to talk, to engage, to bring them on board with this. Then also go outside as well, go outside of industry and go and talk to young people about creating a landscape of the railway for the future so we can get young people on board and really start to think about future skills and plugging the skills gap and inspiring and motivating young people who hadn't necessarily thought about rail as a career but bringing them in because something like this will absolutely appeal to them yeah 100 percent. and that future engagement piece is so vital yeah. i mean we've got a skills gap in rail already of tens of thousands yep. and it's only going to get worse as time goes on so it's so yeah. important i love the kind of the outreach from staff as yep. well because who better to speak about the roles than mm -hmm. the people who are delivering them you touched a little bit on the kind of driver and staff perspective there but i'd love to hear again you know and ollie as well perhaps from the other side of the fence um what staff really think about the system how they engage with it what the feedback's been so far what does the future look like as well you know in terms of development engagement with the staff members who are using the system yeah i don't mind i don't mind chipping in first so 
So GTR have obviously delivered ETCS as part of Thameslink program, so it's just some of the drivers have been in contact with it. I think traditionally, like, like you just said, um, you know, there is a fear that change would drive some of the older members of staff away, but actually we've not, we've not necessarily found that, which, is, which, is, which has been helpful, I think, to say the least. We, we thought originally when we started introducing new fleets that that would actually drive a lot of drivers away, and that didn't at all. And actually they felt, because we went through quite a big period of new trains and then ETCS on top, they felt like ETCS was quite a natural sort of progression on top of a new fleet of trains. So they felt quite comfortable with that. For us, our engagement with the trade unions, and especially ASLEF, has been has been massive to the success that, that we, we found on Thames and that we're finding on Northern City Line. So uh, it'd be fair to say that, that the ASLEF's relationship with GTR isn't, um, they're quite a strong union at GTR, um, but we have an incredibly strong relationship with them. We, we take them, with, they've been around Europe, they've been to Wales, they've driven it, they've understood it, and, they've, and more importantly, they've learned it over the last six years with us as management side, if you like, if you wanted to have those traditional terms. So they understand it as much as we do, so they've taken the fear out of it, and we can have open conversations about it. We found previously, if we go and speak to them about new technology and merely say, you're getting this new technology, their automatic answer is usually no. So learning it together has really developed a really tight-knit relationship where we can solve problems in ETCS that I think five years ago they wouldn't have even understood what the acronym was. Yeah, it's a collaborative approach, again, rather than just mm. implementing something and saying, go and do it, here's a handbook. It's actually about doing it, you know, as part of, to use the phrase railway family, doing it as part of the railway family. I'd love to get the freight perspective. We've had a really similar experience where we we a little bit concerned that it may have turned a few people off and seen a... Um, yeah, seen a, an exodus, but we haven't had that at all. In fact, we've seen interest, really, really keen interest in this from both ends of the spectrum. So from our really well-seasoned and incredibly experienced drivers, but also from our youngest members of staff as well, wanting to know what it is, how can they do more, how can they be involved, and how can they be part of it? be part of it as well because they're real advocates of our business but that kind of filters through other grades as well so for, for me personally it's great to be able to take this away and talk to my colleagues across Europe about it as well and similarly other colleagues in DB so we're so DB is part of a, a huge pan-european organization and obviously this isn't a new system to them but it's really great to be able to pick up with them and have conversations about where about where they are they're learning their best practice and then we can bring that back into our organization as well and really foster that synergy between the between the European entities yeah, international collaboration. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I think coming back then to the route, um, do we see this program as an enabler for a wider rollout of digital signalling? Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, if you look at digital signalling in the UK, um, the pilot was some decades ago now on the Cambrian line, uh, a, a remote line in Wales, relatively simple, you know, start, start small. And then since then we've had Crossrail, and Thameslink both start to use uh, cab-based systems. Crossrail being a new build railway, huge integration challenges, of course, with that, uh, but you get to do it in, a, in an isolated environment. Thameslink, which Ollie has experience of, um, is only using it as a system alongside line-side signalling in order to get automatic train operation through the busiest section in the core. East Coast is that step where we actually move on to a mainline railway where it's mixed-use railway. For the first time, we've got freight operators, we've got on-track machine companies, we've got a broader selection of passenger operators, some suburban commuter, uh, some, some intercity. So we're, we're really testing it and we're moving to that, no, that signals away environment with all of the legacy systems and ways of working today migrating from that to something new. And that's where some of the greatest integration challenges come for us that we're going to unlock. What then follows are a number of other schemes that are going to benefit from East Coast, the work that East Coast has done to do the practical implementation of ETCS on the mainline railway. They're then going to be able to take that operating model that we know works cross-sector with all of, the, all of the partners we have on East Coast and implement it in other parts of the network. There's very deliberately some schemes lined up to do that because there will still be that upfront effort in different parts of the network associated with a migration to something new. What then follows, and what that then forms part of, is having upskilled our industry across different areas of the network and having built the capacity to be able to do this at scale, we can then make this business as usual we will reach a tipping point where a great deal of businesses are what we might call digital ready. 
and there's the skills in place to be able to start to do this the way that we would normally approach a signaling renewal. It won't even be a choice anymore. It will just be the way that we renew our signaling. We will have completed that paradigm shift from where we are today, thinking, oh gosh, this is something big. Let's make sure we've properly understood this and we've got all of the arrangements in place to control it towards this is just the way we do it. What's next? It's funny, isn't it, that the ultimate goal is actually this very exciting programme becomes very standard. <laughs> Almost yeah. the aim is to make yeah. it mundane, BAU kind yeah. of stuff. So, I mean, obviously, it's a really exciting programme to be a part of, though. Um, and in a while, I'm going to ask, you know, what that's been for you like personally. But before we do that, I'd love to know if there are any audience questions. If anyone has anything burning that they'd love to ask about the topic. Gentlemen here. Hi, James. Hi, Andy. Uh, Andy Scott. Like a number of people around the room, I work for myself nowadays. Um, James, I, I know a bit about East Coast um, Digital Programme. I'm just wondering, is there any thinking going on about how we can really lower the cost of um, ETCS and how different approaches to what you fit in the cab or different approaches to things like braking curves and standardisation of them might help to um, improve the case for investing on you know, operational cost reduction, because there's a desperate need for the industry to get its costs in order, isn't yeah. there? So, so let me just take different parts of the programme, actually. So, so if we think about the infrastructure delivery, um, so the bit that all goes to trackside or into our rail operating centres, I've described how the technology in itself is, is more straightforward to deliver. And it's systemically, it's cheaper to be able to deliver because a lot of it is data instead of you know, hard infrastructure. But actually, the way we go about doing that is so important as well. One of the things that we've been trialing on East Coast is the, is the partnership model with the technology provider, which on East Coast is Siemens, is the train control partner. And we've, we've an, empowered them to very much lead delivery for themselves. With, with a very light touch from Network Rail, who would traditionally have quite a heavy project team in the clienting capacity over the top. So we've really tried to thin down and make that model as efficient as possible. On Northern City Line, where we've been proving that, trying it out, putting it to the test, um, we've actually gone from the, the idea of what the outline design might look like through to we've delivered the system, it's there, it's being... It's being uh, tested with the trains, and we're going to start training shortly um, in just two years. And I was with, with colleagues just yesterday where they were saying, how have you done that? You know, you, we would normally take three or four years to get to that point. And, and, and literally, it is about taking the shackles off a very you know, capable tier one supplier to actually get the job done and, and have a very different assurance regime around that to be checking the things that are really important is the system ultimately going to deliver the outcomes we need, not do we agree with every precise way in which you've designed it, um, and focusing on what's important. So I think there's a massive efficiency in the model, which is now being built into how this is going to be procured again in future, and we'll no doubt build on that as well. There's more that can be gone at. On the train side of things, um, the greatest cost is really figuring out for the first time how you retrofit um, some of these trains with this technology. You know, and, and, and this isn't the first time that these trains have had technology put on board since they were manufactured. They've had various things come on, TPWS maybe. And so if you imagine the, the, you know, the driver's environment is already cluttered. The, 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 uh, the loco was never designed with spaces for computer racks to go into. Uh, we've got to work out how we get the cabling to work in some of the more extreme environments, so we're, we're fitting the world's first steam locomotive at the moment with ETCS, um, that actually brings all sorts of other challenges. How do you protect this, this modern technology from the dust, the temperatures, the vibration in such a harsh condition? So all of that has to be figured out the very first time we do this on any particular vehicle type. That brings a lot of cost, obviously. Uh, it takes time. It takes a lot of design and integration effort. It takes prototyping and trialing. We're breaking through that at the moment on East Coast. And actually, 
a great number of the vehicle types that will need to be retrofitted for the next schemes will have been enabled by that. So immediately we'll see that cost come down into more of a production line mindset. But the biggest win is actually that we start buying trains with ETCS. And we stop this retrofitment malarkey. <laughs> you know, it's madness when you think about it. And this technology has been around for decades. And why, why are we not buying trains with it on board? We're, and we're actually having in conversation in some parts of the network where suppliers have said to government and to operators, we will actually charge you to take that technology off now. Um, it comes as fitted, it comes as standard. It's like you go into the car showroom, it's there, it's part of the core spec. And that will radically shift the cost on this. If we can get to the position where it's just already there and we're just doing that integration testing. Brilliant, thanks. The Steam Loco thing sounds fascinating as well. I mean, I don't know how you're going to keep the screens clean enough to read <laughs> in the cab of a Steam Loco, but we definitely have to have another conversation about that. Anything else from the audience? Gentlemen here. Hi, Nick Cornish. I'm just a business analyst working independently. Uh, simple question, but probably fairly complex answer because there's a lot of permutations. But broadly, what sort of capacity uplift do you reckon you'll get on the East Coast Main Line? Say that one more time, sorry, what passenger uplift? What, what capacity, capacity uplift. upgrade capacity uplift. in terms of trains per hour, for instance? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I can, I can talk about it. So I, I, if I look at it, if I look at what the technology has given us at GTR and then what it's going to give us in the future, okay, because it's a, it's a very different environment since we signed up to ECDP and what the, what the railway looks like now post-COVID. Yeah. So the, the technology ultimately, with the, with the right block markers in the right place in the right sections, allowed us to can allow us to run 20, 24 trains an hour, which on Thameslink Core was a massive uplift. And it was only the ETCS technology with automatic train operation on top that could give us that uplift. And that was quite huge. Now, when I look at Northern City Line, which is my next sort of three miles of track that are going to go over to ETCS, we're not actually looking at an increase in the timetable. That is much more of a, a BAU resignaling project. So it can give me exactly what I've got today. In fact, the sections match exactly what they are today. So, and, and East Coast is sort of similar to that, but with some added enhancements for, for more and more trains. Where your real benefit comes from is the way you drive the trains within ETCS. That's what actually increases your capacity. So it's, it's, it's quite, yeah, like you said, it's a quite a complex answer, but because the trains can actually drive to their best abilities, if you like, you can fit more into what was a section that was there previous, if, if that makes sense. So the, the, the other thing I'd add to that is um, actually the, the flexibility that comes with this. So as, as Ollie describes there, you're altering the way in which you drive the trains. That gives you freedom to interpret that into a timetable in different ways. Yep. So, um, so pre-COVID, we might have worried mostly about capacity, you know, standing room only, pack services, how do we get more trains onto the network? Since COVID, we're, we're thinking differently. We're actually thinking, could we get our punctuality better so that passengers have a better experience? Freight users are more inclined to use the railway because they're guaranteed that their, their goods are going to get where they need to be. Um, and also then there's journey time. So, and this is your constant trade-off in a timetable environment. Do I want to put more trains in? Do I want to leave some space for us to recover when things go slightly awry? That's how we preserve the punctuality in times of perturbation. Or do we want trains to go faster uh, to get from A to B? And that last one is actually then when we might be able to compete with other sectors as well. So if we can deliver good freight goods where they need to be quicker than road, if we can deliver passengers where they need to be faster than air, and bearing in mind on East Coast Mainline, we're talking about the Anglo-Scot services there as well, long distance, 400 miles, 600 miles maybe. Uh, so, so the point is that we're actually giving ourselves the opportunity to play the benefits in different ways, depending on what the industry needs to serve its customers. And so it's not all about one thing or another. Actually, you have the freedom to choose when the time comes. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we're coming up to the end of our time now, unfortunately, but I'm sure our speakers will be able to stick around if you want to grab any of them for a conversation. But just in 30 seconds each, and Catherine, if we can start with you, mm -hmm. 
What's it meant to you to work on a piece of work like this personally? Personally, it, I said at the start, it's a game changer. This will revolutionise how we operate the rail network in the UK, and I'm incredibly proud to be part of that. But the biggest thing for me is being able to take it, inspire and lead and motivate a whole new generation of rail network workers and colleagues to come into the railway so it's safeguarded for the future. Brilliant. Uh, I think for us, um, a bit more, probably a bit more basic than that really, it's, it's been nice to be listened to and appreciated when we've put in our opinions and not just feel like a moany operator saying that things aren't right and, and yeah, being able to probably be a bit more of a level playing field and being able to put across the way we feel like the way we feel and being able to take a good thing is even last week we were taking signalers out from York Rock on the train say this is what it looks like and they went, oh, okay, it makes sense. You know, ripping up those boundaries for me has been, been transformational. There you go. Amazing. And I, th I think for me, uh, just... I agree with both those sentiments, but to add something slightly different, I feel like we're unlocking the potential of our industry by actually working together, finding ways to develop things like this together and deliver them together. We're, we're more than the sum of our parts this way. Um, and Andrew, I think, mentioned uh, GBR in the previous section, and he said, don't wait for that. You know, don't let that stop us from getting on with doing the right thing now and making a difference now. And I really believe that's, that's what we've been able to do. And that's really exciting. You know, that, that actually gears a rail industry that is more capable of serving the nation and being relevant tomorrow, um, which is so, so important as we think post-COVID about what is the railway's place in society. Um, yeah, that's for Brilliant. me. It's, it's what we can achieve together. Absolutely. And I think that's a perfect summary of the session, really, isn't it? Unlocking potential is what this is all about. So stick around. Next up, we have Mark Thurston, Chief Exec Officer at High Speed 2. But I would love us to all please give our speakers a massive round of applause. Thank you.